Thank you for watching this Radio Hoo Poo production on John Barrymore and his eccentricities. John's mother, Georgiana Emma Drew, or Georgie Drew Barrymore, was an accomplished actress from the Philly Drew family. She met her husband, British actor Maurice Barrymore, while she was playing in theaters including Broadway. Maurice was born in India and his father worked for the British India Trade Company. He came from a very solid middle class to upper middle class family and was educated at Harrow School and Oxford. While at Oxford, he was the captain of the football team and attained the middleweight boxing championship in 1872. While at Oxford, Maurice preferred his athletic and theatrical companions to others more suited to his class, and he decided to pursue acting. This scandalized his father, and Maurice changed his last name to Barrymore to avoid further scandal. He sailed to the United States in 1874. Maurice attained his first role in Broadway in 1875 with the show Peak, where he met his future wife. When Maurice and Georgie married, uh, Maurice was very creative and contributed to plays, including by writing, and Georgie loved her three children. Maurice was more eccentric than Georgie and bought an exotic animal farm in Staten Island in 1890, and unfortunately, he also embarked on extramarital affairs. By December 1891, Georgiana was no longer able to act, and she moved to California to help control her tuberculosis. Unfortunately, she died in California in 1893, and her last words were about the care of her three young children. Her three young children, Lionel, Ethel, and John, were taken into the care of their maternal grandmother, Louisa Lane Drew, or Mrs. John Drew, as she was known. She was very active in the Philly theater world and managed for decades the Arch Street Theater. At the time, there were only three theaters in Philadelphia, and so her role in theatrics was profound. Ethel Barrymore, the oldest of the Barrymore siblings, was only 14 years old when her mother died, and she was responsible for returning her mother's body back to Philadelphia from California, where Georgiana had been recovering from tuberculosis. Ethel never finished high school despite attending Roman Catholic schools in Philadelphia. She debuted on Broadway um, with the help of her father in 1895 after her mother's death, and she was soon traveling to London to appear in theaters on the East End. It is in London where she had a lot of theatric success. With Ethel sending money back home to her family, including to her two brothers, Lionel and John, her father's activity had worsened. He had syphilis and he was sent to Bellevue Hospital due to his increasing mania. Prior to being confined to the pictured Bellevue Hospital in New York in 1901 by court order, Barrymore had been shot in a fight over gambling debts in Texas in 1879. So this may have contributed to his ill health. He was also touring on vaudeville and in Broadway and working very hard to put food on the table for his children. Maurice was temporarily released from Bellevue Hospital and returned to the stage, including in Harlem but he fell to the ground in 1905 during a performance in New York and needed his son John to drive him to Brunswick Hospital in Amityville, New York, where again, the lingering effects of syphilis were uh, described by doctors. And since there was no cure for syphilis, the outcome looked bleak. Maurice had turned to violence before. Unfortunately, he tried to strangle his daughter, Ethel, when she visited him at Bellevue Hospital years earlier. Maurice died in March 1905 and was buried with his wife in Philadelphia. 
pictured are the Barrymore siblings, Lionel, born in 1878, Ethel, born in 1879, and John, the youngest, born in 1882. While Lionel and Ethel were not able to finish high school because they had to provide for their family by acting, John preferred illustration and did not want to act immediately. He attended Georgetown Prep in Washington, D.C., but was thrown out, some believe for alcoholism and some believe for visiting a brothel. John was exposed to sexual material too early via his stepmother, Mamie Floyd, who his father had married after his mother's death, but was separated from by the year 1900. Mamie made advances to the young John Barrymore, who was alone more often than his siblings, uh, Ethel and Lionel had gone to London and New York to make money for the family while John remained at home and was enrolled in various schools to get an education. John attended many schools, including Seton Hall Preparatory School in New Jersey, Mount Pleasant Military Academy, King's College of Wimbledon, and the Slade School of Art in London. After a year at Slade, John left to pursue nocturnal activities in the city of London, but was hired in 1900 for $50 a week by the New York Evening Journal as an illustrator. John illustrated for the rest of his life, and you can find doodles he made of his wives and ex-wives throughout illustrations while John loved them, unfortunately did not pay the bills, and so he returned at the stage with his father in 1900 in New York and with his sister Ethel in 1901 in Philadelphia. He had a natural genius for acting. Partially powering this genius was John's fear that he would end up like his father, sent to a madhouse. Despite this, he was a very active and social creature and attended parties by Stanford White, the well-known New York City architect. Stanford was in, an, in a relationship with the underage actress, Evelyn Nesbitt, who was controlled by um, her mother and in fact encouraged in her affair with White. Evelyn Nesbitt, I believe, uh, was seen by John Barrymore in her performance as a gypsy girl in The Wild Rose, but various biographers attribute John uh, seeing Evelyn Nesbitt in her Broadway performance of Floradora. Either way, the two met at a party or after a performance in 1901. John was incredibly taken by Evelyn Nesbitt, um, and he called her his first love and the most maddening woman. She was a very popular model and posed for hours and hours to become the Gibson girl of the Gilded Age. And she also appeared on many magazine covers, including uh, this one by Harper's Bazaar. In 1901, when Barry Moore met Nesbitt, she was 16 and he was 18. This was a much smaller age gap than she had with her lover, Stanford White. For all intents and purposes, although it's horrible to say, Nesbitt was very accessible to the artist class in New York City. She was posing nude for paintings painted by Beckwith in 1901. She was encouraged by her mother to engage in affairs with men like White, who built her a red velvet chair in the apartments he had for her in New York City. And so um, artists were of her class. Architect Stanford White, who had deflowered Nesbitt, um, was not a fan of Barrymore. Despite the fact that Barrymore was an actor and an illustrator, he was not considered a good, good match for Nesbitt by her mother as well. And so White and Nesbitt's mother comprised a plan to send Nesbitt to New Jersey for a little while to be away from Barrymore. In 1902, Barrymore actually proposed marriage to Nesbitt in front of White, uh, but she refused and continued to be at boarding school paid for by White. In 1903, while at boarding school, Evelyn Nesbitt had to have an appendectomy. Part of the lexicon at the time was uh, abortions were called appendectomies. So there's a question of whether Nesbitt had an abortion and whether the child aborted was Barrymore's. In addition to this, there is a rumor that she had a child in 1904-1905, which was sent back to Pittsburgh to be raised uh, by her family because she grew up in Pittsburgh. If this child was Barrymore's, it doesn't match the 1901-1902 time frame when he was in love with her and interacting with her. 
Also, Nesbitt had many lovers, including the polo player Monty Waterbury and magazine tycoon Collier. So it's not clear how uh, Barrymore could have been involved. Regardless, Barrymore was asked to take the stand in the 1907 murder trial when Nesbitt's husband, Henry Thaw, shot and killed her former lover, Stanford White. When asked about Nesbitt's, his Nesbitt's history, including her abortions, Barrymore was adamant that she had had no abortions in 1903, and so it appears that her appendectomy truly was an appendectomy. Nesbitt was also able to have children after the fact, which raises questions about this supposed abortion because abortions at the time were incredibly brutal and traumatic, and women would be sewn up, uh, making it very difficult for them to have children in the future. I believe part of Nesbitt's appeal was she combined Barrymore's profession of acting with illustration due to her role as an illustrative model. Next is the Wellington Hotel, where White had a suite for Nesbitt and many of the other women that he would deflower and then record the uh, situations in his little black book, which was found after his death. I include this photo to show the scene and the fact that Nesbitt, uh, before marrying Thaw, was making $300 a day in 2021 money um, by modeling and uh, appearing in some silent films. So um, she claimed that she married Thaw to escape destitution, but I'm, I'm not sure that was entirely the case. Just before Maurice Barrymore passed in 1905, he was talking to his son Lionel and insisted that San Francisco had been destroyed by fire. Well, he seemed to have predicted the future because San Francisco was leveled by an earthquake in 1906 and John Barrymore was on the scene at the time. Barrymore was in San Francisco awaiting travel to Australia with his theatrical troupe when the earthquake struck. According to his autobiography from 1926, Barrymore had been staying up all night and that's why he was in a tuxedo for the duration of the earthquake and many people remember seeing him in his tuxedo helping others out of the rubble uh, the next morning. Another report indicates that Barrymore fell into the bathtub uh, at the first sign of the earthquake and then managed to get himself out and make several phone calls. Rumors sprung up after the fact that he joined the National Guard or a local militia and helped clean up San Francisco, but according to his own autobiography, this did not happen. So the press ran away with the fact that John Barrymore was a survivor of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, and he was dressed in a tuxedo uh, for it by his own admission. San Francisco is also relevant to Barrymore's life because it may be where he was exposed to opium for the first time. Opium dens first were seen in America in the 1880s in San Francisco and were a product of the Chinese immigrants who came and needed to start a business. And so opium dens started and catered to every race, including to whites. Um, drinking was seen as worse than opium intake in the 1880s and 1890s and John Barrymore who had been drinking since he was 14 may have engaged in opium intake uh, as a way to quiet his demons and because he uh, was a hedonist and so I think that San Francisco is relevant for that as well and I will uh, describe John Barrymore's own private opium den later by 1911, when Barrymore was 29 years old, he was a critically acclaimed actor. He had acted under the tutelage of famed directors such as J.M. Barry. He had appeared in famed theaters such as the Garrick Theater and the Lyceum Theater. He had played comedy and tragedy and had been so hardworking that he played in 365 straight performances of single plays. And so now he turned his attention to film. He spotted the young actress Mary Astor, who had a cascade of red hair and was known as The Profile. This was ironic because John Barrymore was known as The Great Profile, so it seemed that Mary Astor was his female foil. Lucille Longhank, or Mary Astor as she would come to be known, was an accomplished piano player. Managed by her mother, who did not let her send her own letters, Mary Astor's life mimicked that of Evelyn Nesbitt's, at least in the beginning. 
1924, John Barrymore saw a photo of Mary Astor and demanded that she play beside him in the movie Beau Brummel. By 1924, Barrymore had been acting in films for over 12 years. It is believed he made his first silent film appearances in 1912 in four films where he was billed as Jack Barrymore, but it's not clear because these films are now lost. By 1924, Barrymore was married to a sociolite, Catherine Corey Harris, who was also an heiress, and she was eight years his junior. She had acted with Barrymore in silent films from 1916. In the 1924 Bal Barrymore was 42 years old and Mary Astor was 18. During the filming of Bal Brummel, Barrymore was no longer married to Catherine, who had remarried and would unfortunately die in 1927. Barrymore continued his dalliance with Mary Astor, uh, including insisting that she be his co-star in the film Don Juan. Uh, this and Bal Brummel are both remarkable films, and I encourage you to watch them if you are into silent film at all. Don Juan actually holds the record for the most on-screen kisses, including uh, hand kisses and kisses on the cheek. Barrymore wooed Astor very hard and said that she was so beautiful she made him feel faint. Um, to get around her parents' strict rules, he would insist on holding private lessons for her uh, in his apartment and elsewhere. Her parents were scandalized by this and they refused them uh, to get married. And this really broke Barrymore's heart as well as Astor's heart. She would go on to have much more heartbreak as would he. However, um, Barrymore would marry one of Astor's contemporaries, Dolores Costello, who was considered a very high class beauty. And they would go on to have children and uh, Drew Barrymore, the actress of today, is John Barrymore's granddaughter through this union. Barrymore married Dolores in 1928 and the year before he was at his first wife's uh, deathbed when she died from pneumonia in 1927. Barrymore's acting and embrace of new technologies with the camera can be seen in his 1920 Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I cannot understate how skilled John Barrymore is, and he was highly applauded by critics all throughout the United States and Europe. His acting really is incomparable. Alcohol was cited by both John Barrymore and Catherine as the reason for the breakup of their seven-year-long marriage. In an attempt to dry out, Barrymore actually undertook an ocean cruise, and he wound up drinking anything and everything he could get his hands on, including mouthwash, perfume, kerosene, and spirit of camphor. He was addicted to alcohol. In June 1931, newspapers reported that Barrymore had the largest collection of odd pets in Hollywood, with everything from a Japanese monkey to a tame opossum to a South American kinkajou. Barrymore would purchase these animals from magazine listings and get them shipped from their native habitats to his home. Pictured is Barrymore on the 1926 set of The Sea Beast, where uh, his wife Dolores Costello was also starring. Barrymore would go on to have dogs with his fourth wife, Elaine Barry, and you can see pictures of him with his dogs uh, in many of his houses in New York and also in California. Also in his California manor, you can see the high ceilings. It is reported that he had two eagles and he kept them in a very large column in part of this house. He also had a dinosaur skull in this house and a shrunken heads. This seven acre property in Beverly Hills was known as Bella Vista. Listed for sale for over $40 million in 2015, Bella Vista was built for John Barrymore in the late 1920s and he lived in the home until he died. The property includes guest uh, houses, which were used by Barrymore's many guests and family members, and it's also do it was also dominated by a 30-foot totem pole he stole from an Alaskan village. One of the more unique rooms in the home is an opium den. You can see the high windows. Uh, these were designed so that the toxic air would remain in the room and keep the guests high. 
the opium pipe with its long uh, snout would also be passed around and you can see the pillows and carpeting on the floor. Dolores and John would be married for six years. Their marriage eventually ended in 1934. It's believed that John created the Bella Vista estate partly for Dolores. He included gardens, fountains, as well as skeet shooting ranges. Uh, with his last wife, Elaine Barry, the relationship was very different. She was m much younger than him, and they spent a lot of time in New York City. Barrymore inspired no shortage of younger actors, and Errol Flynn, the Australian actor who would later play John Barrymore in a biographical film, uh, looked up to him in a, in a big way. Flynn didn't live up to Barrymore's um, accreditation and skilled acting, however, and Flynn's eventual charge in statutory rape in Chicago is something I believe John would never have gotten involved with. Orson Welles was another huge fan of Barrymore and actually saw Barrymore's Hamlet uh, when Barrymore was on stage in his younger years and it's part of what inspired Orson Welles to be the filmmaker that he became uh, in America. Barrymore in his later years was remembered for his party antics. He could mimic anybody according to Wells. He was an incredible friend to all who knew him, uh, but he was reduced to taking roles that poked fun at him as a declining alcoholic actor. And uh, it's remembered that in several of his performances on stage, he was so drunk that he would look out into the audience and ask for tea or relieve himself into flower pots on stage. Barrymore never won an Oscar despite being publicly called a genius. His brother Lionel did win an Oscar, as did his sister Ethel Barrymore. I can't understate how much Ethel kept this family together. It was she who paid her father's bills when he was in hospitals. It was she that kept the family going and introduced them to the theater. It really is thanks to Ethel Barrymore that the acting family of Barrymore continues today. In 1942, Barrymore was doing radio work for NBC and poking fun at himself, his marital issues, his drinking. When he collapsed during a line of Romeo and Juliet, he was rushed to the hospital, but due to extensive da damage to his liver from drinking, he died, unfortunately, in California in 1942. He left behind a legacy for his children. He did not have much money to give and was largely bankrupt. I would love to see a biopic of Barrymore. Uh, he was incredible, but I don't know what young American actor could play him. I don't know if any are up to it. Thank you for watching this Hoo Poo Radio production. There is a macabre story told by Errol Flynn that Flynn's friends dug up Barrymore's body and then propped him up in Flynn's house as a practical joke. Um, this unfortunately did happen. Barrymore was buried eventually by his son in Philadelphia so he could be closer to his parents.